Simon Morris, what is flight light? Okay. Flight light is a levitating light that levitates with magnetic levitation and is powered through the air wirelessly through induction. Welcome to the Invention Stories Podcast, where we share stories of inventors who turn their idea into a product. Please visit our website at www.inventionstories.com. And now, from the Invention Stories Podcast World Headquarters Studios in Morro Bay, California, is our host, Robert Baer. Welcome to the Invention Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Baer, and thank you for joining us. You're listening to Episode 45, Simon Morris and Flight. Simon Morris has invented what I thought was previously impossible. He invented Flight Light, a levitating light bulb that can be turned on and off. And I can't describe how cool this is. You either need to go to inventionstories.com or to the Flight website at flyte.se and check out the videos. This invention has earned him one of the best inventions of 2016 by Time Magazine. And since then, he's created Life Planter and the Story Time Piece, which we will be discussing today. I've wanted to interview Simon for a long time, so I'm really excited to have him on the line from Latvia. So let's get started. Simon, welcome to the Invention Stories podcast. I want to start off with the basics. Where are you from and where's the business headquartered? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, I am from uh, New York. I was born and raised in New York. So yeah, contrary to some of the articles that are out there saying I'm from Sweden, that is that is incorrect. We are based, uh, we have headquarters in New York, but we have branches all over and recently in Latvia. So we have multiple offices just to work with the local markets that we sell in. But the idea and all the original, where we kind of like to say we're from, where it started, was New York. Okay. Uh, Are you from New York City or upstate New York? Well, I was born in the Bronx, and I lived right outside the Bronx my whole life in Westchester, which is about, it's right on the border of the Bronx, a small town. Okay, that sounds cool. Sounds nice. When you were a kid, and you were told to go color, and they gave you crayons, Maybe they gave you markers or something. You know, some people could really draw inside the lines. And and I'm just thinking, since you're such a different kind of guy, what were you doing? Were you creating some piece of artwork that was really revolutionary? Well, probably if I was given a piece of paper at that age, I probably would have ripped it up. I don't know. I, I don't consider myself a terribly good artist, but I do like to think out of the box. It always sort of kind of my survival skill in trying to adapt to new changes. I moved a lot when I was a kid. I don't know if that has some influence on it, but I think trying to challenge what was already out there or I didn't at the time consider it was being creative, but it was for me kind of just trying to survive and adapt. So yeah, I I like to have fun and growing up, I skateboarded. I was a big skateboard fan and was very interested in that kind of sport, if you call it a sport. But for me, it was more like a way to express yourself, express individual freedom. And that kind of led me on to other things, including levitation. But we can talk about that later. Were you like a trick skater? Did you do the half pipe? Uh, Were you a a thrill seeker on it? Or did you use it more for transportation or... Uh, street. I like to skate the street. And at the time, you know, there weren't so many skate parks where I was. So it would, we'd end up going to the town square um, shortly after we would be um, accompanied by police saying, you know, you're not allowed to skate here, <laughs> sort of things like that. So it was always testing those boundaries and trying to do tricks in public spaces. Uh, for me, it was kind of an expression of one's freedom. But there was always a lot of resistance to that. Later on, I tried skate park, but I uh, always preferred the public domain. Right on. Skateboarding always seems to be uh, just a little bit different. The, the guys who are skating tended to be a little bit different. And you're right. Cops seem to, like, hassle them. <laughs> yeah, at the time, it wasn't very well regarded. It was considered vandalism or something. You know, you're destroying the benches and things like that, which was probably true. But... We were having a lot of fun. I think we just needed a, a place to uh, express ourselves, and um, the city didn't have a place like that. And 
It was a place to socialize and uh, express you know, physical performance and stuff like that. And we always felt a little bit of outsiders compared to most institutionalized sports. So it was always a kind of a resistance in skateboarders. They always had kind of like a sort of a bad reputation, you know, counterculture and things like that. So kind of fell into that realm. Right on. Were you a good student? Good. Were you a quick learner? Funny, yeah. Um, I was never really particularly, how can I say, uh, encouraged to do school activities or um, excel in school. But funny enough, I did okay. I managed to get honors and stuff like that and get in the top tier of my school. But I didn't particularly find it motivating or interesting. So at the my senior year, I kind of withdrew a little bit and tried to focus on my interests. So I went to the library a lot my last year and said, you know what, I'm not getting what I need from the teachers. Maybe I'll just try to explore and discover my own interests. Did you go to college? Yeah, I did. I did. I went to college. I went to several universities. I finished half of my BA in New York, and then the other half I completed abroad in Paris. How many languages do you speak? Ah, let's see. French, Swedish, um, learning a little bit of Chinese, English. That's it. Nothing like a crazy uh, average European, but probably, yeah, I love languages. It's really interesting. Do you like traveling? Because... I've tried to track you down for a couple of months and hook up with you when you were in Paris, but I think you were doing some show. Do you like to travel? Yeah, I do like to travel. I like to travel when it's kind of not really related to work, but and I can explore. But it is really fun to uh, discover new places and doing this work that I'm interested in. So we've been a lot to Asia where we produce a lot of the electronics come from. And it's always fun to do that at the same time. But yeah, when we're traveling, it's, you know, we always want to go to the Great Wall or go to places that are more exotic than where we are. But we like to get it when we can. It's always nice to see new perspectives and see how different cultures work. And uh, that has been inspiring. Okay. Well, first of all, do you like to being called Magneto or is that sort of a joke or a play? (laughs) <laughs> no no yeah people yeah you can call me like Neil. that's okay um not everyone does that but it's just yeah it's kind of we're just kidding around but definitely was always fascinated by science specifically magnetism one of those cool forces you see the uh everything surrounding the effects when you see like uh you line up iron filings and you put two magnets together and you see the pattern that it forms but it's a really good indication of these sort of like a, an invisible world. And it kind of reminds me of the things that we don't see, certain spectrums. And I think it falls in the category of magnetism. It's one of these fascinating, uncanny forces that are around us all the time. I got really very interested in that. So you were like a science guy or a physics guy? Where's your passion? Yeah, my passion is in science and art. So I am very interested in how things work and the uh, technicalities, the scientific methods, how we observe the world. But also, as you mentioned earlier in this conversation, a lot of technical people who are very knowledgeable in the sciences seem to lack another part, which is the design part, which is the user friendliness. So the personality. And to me, I think to really get a complete picture, feels like you really need to integrate those, like Leonardo da Vinci did. And he was an artist, but he also was a scientist. And it's very rare to find people that can bridge both worlds, and that what inspires me a lot. So I just tried to absorb as much as I could and get involved with, I did study sciences and computer sciences, but also I studied art and creative expression. And I think flight was a little bit of a kind of a, a testament to that um, was a combination of science, poetry, and uh, something that's very easy for people to understand. And then when they look at it, they get it right away. So I feel happy at the end of the day if if I could achieve that, when something that looks very simple from the outside but has a complexity inside. Did you say people get it right away? 
Because uh, don't people like not get it? Like, how did you do that? <laughs> yeah, well, that's that is this <clears throat> to me when I've experienced people see a levitating light. I mean, they get that it levitates. They may not get how it works, but the second question, the follow up question is like, oh, how does that work? But the first the understanding of it is like, whoa, that's floating in the air. So when I meant get it, they get that it's something that's floating in the air, but they don't get exactly how it works. So it's a funny kind of polemic experience. I mean, take, for example, the 3D printer. When you look at the 3D printer, you might not even understand what it is, right? But you know it does something. And that is, you know, a technological innovation. But what I like to consider the levitating light bulb as is something that you, you see it and you understand it immediately. It's something there's no learning curve. Of, of course, you need to know how it works. And the scientific mind is always inquiring about that. So we get a lot of questions. How does it work after, after the first wow factor? Probably one of the questions you get is, is this going to electrocute me? <laughs> I've only seen it on video. I, I wish I had one in front of me to, to have and use. But let me ask you sort of how it led into it. Did you have other jobs growing up or were you always sort of an entrepreneur? Did you think you were going to be an entrepreneur? No, I had no idea. I had no idea what to expect. I was always curious and I still am. I like to question everything I can. But when it came to growing up, I was tutoring students in subjects like math and science in high school. And then afterwards, I got very much involved in music and different, yeah, pretty much anything I could get my interest in and dive into. So my approach has always been, yeah, just if you like something, just learn how it works. And if you like something, you're probably going to get good at it. So I just kept plugging away. And one of the things that I got really hooked on was magnetism and thinking a lot about my experience as a skateboarder too, how that kind of reflected my thoughts about why am I doing tricks in the air? Why am I jumping up and thrusting uh, force on the board so that uh, with a counter force that can allow me to jump for a small amount of time in the air, which they call an ollie, right? Why am I trying to always defy gravity? And why as a species, we seem to always question, you know, this gravitational force when trying to fly and dreaming of flying. And so all those kind of factors would help me kind of formulate hypothesis on on that and that crystallized into this project called flight which which levitates objects in the air and and also integrates wireless power so it's a levitating bulb which is powered wirelessly through the air now the first product that you tried to create was flight light is that correct or because i'm looking at your description here and it says projects such as music concrete nike air max one reinvented what are these exactly? Oh, yeah. So leading up to flight, um, I was working as a freelancer for companies like Nike and Urban Ears. They're, they're bigger brands. And I was hired as a, as a researcher and developer, as a freelancer, to come up with some cool wow moments. And so Nike Air Max 1 was a levitating shoe. So that was a shoe that was suspended in the air with uh, electromagnetic levitation. Um, music Concrete was a music project that involved hooking up a skateboard with certain sensors that trigger sounds while you're riding the skateboard. So uh, that was that project. So for that Nike sneaker, was that your first foray sort of into the flight light and the life planter and the story time piece? Sounds like you got to learn how to do it and test it and try it and Absolutely. Absolutely. It was sort of a, a segue into a larger project. But yeah, I gained a little bit of experience as a freelancer. And then I gave my own shot at it and said, you know, what is one of the most common metaphors of an idea is a light bulb to me. And what if we could levitate that light bulb and power it through the air? So uh, shortly after those freelance projects, I just started to do my own thing. And started a crowdfunding campaign with a friend and yeah basically we were amazed at the feedback we got from people just totally blown away and our target funding goal was eighty thousand dollars and i think we blew that out of the water by 700 percent. so we got way overfunded and that sort of was the 
impetus for us to start a company and get this out to more people. I have here your flight light, $80,000 goal. You had 2,085 backers and you raised $617,258. I had two questions. One, why did you choose Kickstarter over like Indiegogo or any other crowdfunding platform? And two, did that just blow your mind? (laughs) Yeah, well, we chose Kickstarter because it was one of the earliest crowdfunding platforms, and we believed a lot in their philosophy and ideals. So we, they have recently turned into a, a public benefit corporation, and they really want to focus on creators and creativity and how to bring more creativity to the world. And we kind of jived with those ideas. So we started Kickstarter, and then two, yeah, it blew my mind. We were totally taken back at the response we got from the crowd which is people like you and me who love the idea. They wanted to back it. They haven't seen anything like it and they wanted to support it. And I think that's what led to our, you know, where we are now. Thanks to that. Did you know for sure that you could create the flight light when you ran the uh, pain? (laughs) I had no idea. We were, well, we were in prototyping. I mean, we were, a lot of it was just Oh, it was definitely not a mass-produced product at that stage. We were just getting our hands dirty and doing quick and dirty prototypes. When I look back at that time, I just see the prototype. I'm like, oh, you know, but that's what it is. That's what it's like to be an entrepreneur and just do things and uh, learn by doing. That's been a, a lot of, you know, our belief. And having an idea is one thing, right? But execution and getting that idea to be realized is a whole set of different skills to, to me. And that's been our journey, getting that idea into some in a reality. And that's pretty much the journey with Kickstarter. We were a little bit late up, only a couple of months in terms of Kickstarter time. I think we are less than average. The average uh, delay on Kickstarter, I think, is close to eight months. And I think we were only about one or two months delayed. So we were happy that we actually managed to do that with such a small team. When you were able to fill the orders, did it cost what you thought? Uh, did it take? Well, it probably took a little bit longer than you'd hoped, but it, did it kind of take as long as you thought? It took us, well, we estimated, we were pretty close in our estimation. Costs always creep up. That was one thing. Um, so we wanted to be super safe, make sure that there was room, there was some margins for error. And because it's the first time you're making this product, there's always bottlenecks. And we're pretty lucky to be overcome those challenges and fulfill to the backers and get really happy faces after that. It was very stressful. Uh, We had seven, you know, working nonstop, but uh, we're very glad to do it. And it really inspired us to go further with it, with uh, subsequent Kickstarter campaigns. At the time you did your first crowdfunding campaign, how many were there in your group? When we did the first Kickstarter campaign, there were two in our group. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. And at the same time, we were working a freelance job. So emailing people on the computer while we were working at a second job, it was nonstop. I mean, literally, just a, yeah, it was only a few hours of sleep a day. But um, we got through that time and we hired more people and we were able to grow. But yeah, it was very intense. On the uh, campaign, you had a flight makers kit that you had for 149. I look on your website and I just see the flight light, the life planner, and the story timepiece. I don't see a flight maker kit. Do you still sell that, or did nobody want it? Or oh yes, the flight maker kit was a DIY levitation kit where it included a magnetic base and a floater magnet, where people could levitate their own creations. And it was specifically for the Kickstarter campaign. We did decided not to put that in our store later on. So it was, it was one of the extra pledges that we added into the Kickstarter campaign. Why? I mean, it sounds like it could be potentially bigger. It certainly is more affordable than anything else you have. I mean, I could see so many people. It's like unlimited what you could put on it. It's, it's a base that is it the exact same bases that you use for the flight life and the life planner? 
similar, the, not exact the same base, but similar. And yes, uh, it does have a lot of potential. You know, what we wanted to focus on, because we're such a small team, was to focus on building our design uh, brand and what we thought would be, I think, the focus of our vision. But of course, there's a lot of potential with that. And we still have products coming down the pipeline that touch on those points. But to do customized products or the ability, a kit for people to customize their own projects seemed a little bit off of our vision. So we decided to phase out of that. Simon Morris, what is Flight Light? <laughs> okay. Flight Light is a levitating light that levitates with magnetic levitation and is powered through the air wirelessly through induction. And you turn on the light by tapping the base. Is that correct? Yes. When I see lights, they're usually up on the ceiling and you have it switch in the base. Could it be like on a switch on the wall or something? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The switch could be an input device and it could be triggered through a phone or a switch. Or in this case, we use a touch switch. When you tap on the base, it will trigger the switch to turn on and off the light. But yes, you could have it vertically suspended and levitating in that orientation as well. Do you ever have, I don't know, somebody from a big company or maybe a museum say, hey, can you build this like a thousand times bigger so we could put it in the middle of our lobby and people could ooh and ah? <laughs> can you build me a huge one? Yeah, sure. We, we Every day we get inquiries about what can I levitate or what is possible and theoretically anything is possible. Um, you just have to apply enough magnetic force the larger object you want to levitate, the, the larger the magnet and the larger the base has to be. So it, it grows exponentially. But yeah, I've got inquiries. Can you levitate a human? Can you levitate a car? Can you levitate my logo? <laughs> um, it happens, yeah, <laughs> very often, actually. And it's fun to get the responses. Now, the base, it can be plugged in, but it doesn't have to be, right? Does it have a battery charge or anything? The base does not have a battery charge. It could, but at the moment we wanted to keep it simpler. So, but yeah, there it is possible to power it with a battery, but then at some point you'd have to charge the battery, thus needing a cable anyway. So at the moment we have it powered with a cable, which is a low voltage cable, so it doesn't consume much power. You know, everybody looks at the flight light a little bit differently, and I like it that you had, I guess it was... Some fashion designer had had a show and, and had it up on the stage, like a bunch of them. And that seemed really cool. You know, I'm in, here in California. I'm thinking about a pool party. And I was just thinking, like, if it was waterproof and you could put them on top of a pool, like when you have a party and you could, like, look, everybody be tripping out looking over at your little flight lights. Like, if it was waterproof and if the base were charged, just kind of floating on top of the water, I'd Oh, it's nice to hear. Everyone has a great, and it's great that it can inspire people to, sure, I mean, the sky's the limit, literally. Now, the flight base is made of sustainable source oak, ash, and walnut. Those are all different woods? Yes. Okay, so people have their own choice of what base they would like? Yes, yes. Uh, we have a different range of base finishes and colors and different. So we use a medium to dark to light depending upon personal choice of someone's home, whether it matches their furniture or whether it prefer a dark. Our best seller is the oak. Walnut also sells really well. What's the size of it? It's 125 millimeters, 12.5 uh, centimeters. I forget how that is in inches. Maybe seven or eight inches. It's a square base, and the bulb is like a normal kind of Edison bulb. So we tried to keep the form factor very minimalist. But of course, if you want to levitate something larger, you would need a larger magnet and a larger base. So life, for example, is a little bit larger because the planter is a bit heavier. So we needed a more robust base. Wow. I didn't really think of that. I didn't have my hands on the actual life planter. In fact, it looked kind of small. But certainly it's got to be a little bit heavier than, than a light bulb. 
So what is the uh, life planter? The life planter is a floating planter that levitates through electromagnetic levitation. And it is used in decorative applications when people want to levitate their plants. Now, why would somebody want to levitate their plants? I think there's a lot of different reasons, mainly because I think people think it's cool, the idea of a plant suspended in the air. Normally, when we think of plants, they're pretty grounded in the earth, and they have roots and things like that. The thing with a life planter is that we wanted to nourish life, but in a different way. You can use any plant you want, but we recommend air plants. Air plants are plants that don't need to be in soil. So the life planter complements excellently with the air plant. So we call the system life. It seems kind of small, and that's cool, but do you ever have some of your feedback that, hey, can you make it bigger? Yeah, we, we get feedback. We always get feedback from people who like it larger. Again, we'd have to scale up the size of the base and the magnet. But as a decorative piece for people who like to have plants around their home and have it spinning around, and the air plants themselves aren't large plants, so they work well in our products. The life planter, you just have like one container, right? Or do you have multiple containers? So at the moment, we have one container in one color, but we're going to roll out next year multiple colors. But it's a silicon skin shell, so it has a nice tactile rubbery feel. But you just drop in the plant and it levitates. What color is it? It's white. Okay, so did you do it like that so people could draw on it? Did that enter your mind? or why, I mean, why not have it black? White, uh, I think, gives a good contrast to the oak base and creates a little bit of lightness, we thought. But of course, I mean, everyone has their own preference in what color it is. It's a subjective uh, matter for people. So we do get questions, and that's why we decided to have a different array of colors so people can choose the colors they suit them the best. Is the base the same? The base is the same. It's made of sustainably sourced oak. It has a connector in the back. The only difference is with the flight light is that the flight light transmits power to the bulb. There is no wireless power transmission to the plant, unless you want to light up a plant, but <laughs> that's not in our, in our, on our agenda. You know, I'm going to be the only guy who's not going to ask you how you do that with the electricity. It seems like the flight light and the life planter are somewhat related, but the story timepiece is so much different. What is the story timepiece, and how did the idea come to you? Story timepiece is a levitating timepiece consisting of a sphere, um, which levitates above a rounded wooden surface, and it can be levitated in multiple orientations. And that sphere levitates and actually moves around an orbit, telling the time. The sphere represents, it's like a, as a marker, it's an indicator, and it can represent an hour hand or it can represent any interval you decide. The idea came working a lot with levitation and thinking, where else can we take it? So the flight light and the life planter were all great projects, but we believe that you know we wanted to take it to the next level and offer people a new way to look at levitation actually as a moving thing. So I came up with the idea and launched a campaign around it, and that's where we are now. So you haven't delivered them yet? Nope. We are still in the process of finalizing some of the manufacturing uh, details, um, getting them absolutely certain that everything is working properly before we fulfill. How big is it? Yeah, maybe like this, uh, the round of a Frisbee, probably. Imagine a Frisbee disc and a sphere, a uh, levitating chrome sphere, uh, rotating around that Frisbee disc. That's basically the size of it, yeah. I look at it like it's a wall clock, and you have your orb, the ball, that sort of rotates in a gigantic circle, like a second hand. Is that how it works? Yeah, it's like... It it's like the planet going around the sun, it's, uh, and that sphere represents the planet, and uh, it goes around a trajectory around the perimeter of the, the circle, the disk, 
And that sphere can move around the disk once an hour or once a minute or once every 12 hours. So yes, it is like a wall clock. It can actually be fixed on a wall. And the cool thing about that is different from our previous levitation products is that it can levitate in the vertical orientation. Okay, so and when you're testing it, has, does the ball ever fall off? So if you unplug the device, the sphere will stick back to the wooden disc. It doesn't just fall off or drop unless you take it in your hands and you drop it on the floor. But in most scenarios, if you cut the power off, just like you would with a light or the planter, it will fall back to the base. And it's the same with the story. I have your stats on the Kickstarter. I believe you raised 328000 for the Life Planter, and you raised 696000 for the Story Timepiece. After having great success with the Flight Light, did you expect to have these kind of numbers? Uh, were you happy with them? I mean, most people would be blown away by raising 328000 for the Life Planter, but maybe after raising 600000 on the Flight Light, were you disappointed? Oh, not at all. Not at all. We're just happy to have reached our funding goal. And anything past that is much more than appreciated. It, it's, uh, we consider it a success. We're very happy with our funding with Kickstarter, and we're just thrilled to be able to give it back to the people who backed it. And that's been our mission, is to support the community of people who are the early adopters who have believed in the product since the beginning and you know, we're there to serve them and, and create a great product in the end. Yeah, I, uh, I was hoping you weren't going to be too hard on yourself because that's an incredible amount to raise. What exactly is your role with Flight? My role is the creator, I'm the creator of the, uh, of the project. And I focus now on research and development. So coming up with new product ideas, researching new inventions and innovation and moving the technology forward. So that's my role in flight. We're a team of about 10 people now. So running from sales to logistics to bookkeeping to <laughs> lots of different production. We have lots of different roles. So um, yeah, it's been a great journey so far. And we're very happy to be able to fulfill the demands of people. And it's been a great demand ever since we started. So our challenge is to have enough supply. So do you do your role because that's where your passion is? I mean, like the day-to-day -day operations, I didn't hear you saying you're overseeing that or the marketing or production of everything. Absolutely. I love to do, you know, I think we'd, it's always inspiring to do what we like to do, what we love to do. Of course, I do the day-to-day -day administration and that takes a lot of my time. But essentially, creating the project is where the true passion is. And my goal is to get as close as to there as I can. But there are other activities or other things that we must do in order to get there. So being a startup, you end up doing a lot of different things, <laughs> wearing a lot of different hats. Yeah. Yeah. If you're a creative guy, if your your passion is in research and development, the last thing a, you know somebody who's creative wants to do is accounting, you know, or bookkeep. Generally, I'm not saying every time, every, people are different. So how about time management? What's your work-life balance like? Mm, interesting. Um, well, we have a team of people in different countries and in different time zones, and it's always a challenge to get synced up. When you wake up early, you have to get China because they're six or seven hours ahead of you. And I'm speaking with you, and you're just waking up, so... How I manage time usually is through organization, just like anybody else. I guess we have calendars, we have Skype calls, we try to do check-ins on a daily basis with our team, uh, making sure you know we're putting out all the buyers that need to be put out. It's a challenge. It's really hard to balance your work and life, especially being the creator. It's your idea and you hold it very dearly and you hold it very closely and sometimes it's a challenge to let that go and focus on other things but at the same time it's very fun so it doesn't feel like work but there's definitely a lot of things you have to consider and different parts of your brain that get activated like you said when you're doing accounting 
it's almost like you're accessing a different part of your brain than you would be if you were in a creative flow. And I think taking some time off and taking a step back would be very useful for any person who's doing similar things, just to meditate or just kind of let it go, uh, take some rest. I think that was very helpful. Sounds helpful. Uh, how about reducing price? You know, because you've ab- able to raise all this money, were you able to get better terms or better prices on your materials? Do you ever have a goal of trying to reduce the price of your products? Um, I, and that's all relative anyway, you know, price. Absolutely. Um, it, it, it can be observed uh, for certain Yeah, people have definitely commented on the price. And as we want to focus more on design and get, um, of course, we'd love to get it at the most affordable way we can possible. Unfortunately, we're not able to negotiate better terms with our manufacturers just because we've raised X amount. It really is a different, there's a lot of factors at play, including prices that are controlled by the government. So it's very have been a challenge to get that price point right. Of course, as we grow and expand, we think that we're able to offer a more affordable price and also down the line come up with products that are at a better price point for certain people. Um, otherwise, you know, many people find the price okay. As you said, it's, it's relative. So in terms of designer lamps, we think we're at a pretty okay price compared to other designer lamps. So we're trying to find that balance. I think a lot of them are just marketing something or they are changing the design of something, but you're actually doing something that's like totally cool. If anybody's listening and learning about flight for the first time, it's one thing to talk about it, but when you actually see it, it's like, wow, it's it's one of those things that's mind-blowing. But you touched on your manufacturer. How did you decide on a manufacturer? You don't do it in-house, right? Or do you? No, we don't do it in-house. No, we source a lot from different parts of the world. We have a, an element there that has, as you mentioned, it's, it's more of an innovative thing. Uh, we're combining technology with design, new technologies. So we have a certain limitation on our suppliers and our manufacturers. But, you know, there is an electronic component to what we do. And most of the electronics in the world I'm from Asia, so we do source components just like many electronics from that same source. Do you get companies throwing money at you or offering you a lot of money to come work for them? Uh, it's interesting. Um, well, we get offers every now and then. When we were awarded Time Magazine, one of Time Magazine's best inventions, 2016, we got a lot of traction after that. and. You know, it's always great to be working with great minds and great people. So, yeah, but, you know, we want to focus more on our vision and our brand and make flight, you know, as successful as possible. Yeah, you know, I wanted to bring up Time Magazine's, uh, like you said, you were 2016, one of the top 25 inventions of the year. Was that pretty cool? Not only from like, yeah, somebody appreciates me or more because I get all this really great publicity. Did it catch you off guard? I mean, was that a pretty cool phone call to get? Walk me through that. How, how was that? Totally unexpected. You know, we got an inquiry. We sent them a demo. We hadn't heard back from them in over six months. And then we got a phone call. And we did an interview. was expecting a just small little blurb. But yeah, surprisingly, we had this massive exposure uh, for such a small company. Compared to the other 24 inventions that were on that list, we were just blown away. And yes, of course, it did convert into more sales and more attention and more awareness that has helped us enormously. But um, what an honor for us to be mentioned in such a well-known publication. We were really excited about that. What is your marketing strategy? Obviously, you have your website, www.flight.se. Yep, that's correct. Okay, and then um, I also know that you can purchase it in stores and on Amazon, but like you're in Lafayette now, is that a sourcing? Is that trying to get them to stores or? We sell mainly in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, that's where our main markets are. 
And we sell in stores. Yeah, we sell in the MoMA design shop in New York and in MoMA San Francisco, California. We're selling in Neiman Marcus. So yeah, bigger retailers and in Europe as well. Um, we've always aimed towards getting it out to people in, to see in stores because it's something you have to really see in real life to kind of see the full picture of it. So that's helped us a lot. Our retail, that's our strategy is, I guess, to get it out to people, to shops and stuff, but also online. We sell a lot online. I mean, we sell a lot as relative, but we sell our products online in addition to in stores. Is everything patented currently? Yeah, we patented our device. We tried to get it as early in the process as possible. We've trademarked the name. We've tried to get all our IP in one place. And yes, there have been challenges with counterfeits. There's a whole process for that, which is very different from the creation process. It's more of an administrative process. When somebody copies you, that's got to be like kind of hurtful. But at the same time, they're not going to copy you if if what you have isn't worth copying. What was that like when you saw your the first time somebody copied you? Oh, yeah, that's a very common practice. And we like to be associated as innovators uh, rather than counterfeit copiers. It's not our business model. And you know, with story and life and flight are all testaments to that innovation that we're trying to promote. And we always feel that innovation will lead the way. Albeit it is annoying to get counterfeits and we want to avoid that, but we do everything we can to always lead through innovation and we believe will help our brand. When you choose what to do next, you have the option of making modifications, uh, changing the size or changing whatever to what you have existing or doing something completely different. How do you decide that? Is it based on the, the customer feedback or is, it, or is it more out of your passion or ideas? It's a mix of both. We love to hear back from people and we always welcome um, their thoughts, uh, especially if they're have an experience with the product and, and have purchased it and and would like, you know, we have opportunities for them to comment on it. And also we have ideas and visions and, and creative juices flowing. So we try to integrate those two and come up with some new products. I can say for 2018, we're going to come up with several new products. I can't explain now what they are, but we're really excited to have them in the flight family. Yeah, I believe there will be quite exciting for people to see and to experience and yeah introduce new products into our ecosystem what do you think has been a good use of your money and time and then what do you think has been just a waste of your time and money well it's really hard to look back at and say oh if i did this thing different it would have been this way but we definitely learn a lot from having an idea turn into a multinational company in such a short time and there's a lot of mistakes we made and also things that we were very proud of there are a few things i just to mention very briefly would be important for any startup with an idea is to make sure that idea can be realized how can i say well one thing i think that did work for us was using a crowdfunding platform because Prior to that crowdfunding platform, we were looking for investors, and that takes a lot of time and administration and sometimes can deter you or slow you down. If you have an idea, you want to get it out. What we liked about the crowdfunding platform is you can have an idea, pitch it to people, and within 30 days, you can get funded. And that was instrumental to us and a catalyst for us to turn into a company. So I don't know if it would be possible if we were to do it by traditional means. So that was something I learned. One of the other challenges that we've kind of come across, law and administration, there's always questions around that and making sure that your IP is protected and making sure you do that in advance before you share your ideas. And So those are the, some of the things that I've learned in my journey. Yeah, I love crowdfunding. I think it's a great market research tool with the added benefit of raising money. I just have five more questions for you. 
And these next four, they're going to be about your passion. What have you mastered? What are you really good at? I think I'm pretty good at Skype calls. I've gotten good at Skype calls uh, just because we have a team all over the world. Okay. What gives you hope? What gives me hope is to see people smile. How about what blows your mind? People. People blow my mind. What change would you like to see in the world? Humor. More humor. I want to thank you for being our guest today on the Invention Stories podcast. I just have one last question, and that is, uh, what advice would you give an inventor who's got an idea for a product? They ask you for advice. What would you tell them? To do it. Not just to have the idea, but to actually do it and to not be afraid of doing it wrong or what people think is wrong. Learning from mistakes is the greatest inventions that came out of humanity. So not giving up. You've been listening to episode 45 of the Invention Stories podcast with Simon Morris and Flight. I want to thank Simon for being our guest today. More information can be found at flyte.se. If you would like to become a sponsor of the Invention Stories podcast or have a suggestion on how we can make it better, please contact us at inventionstoriespodcast at gmail.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we invite you to write a positive review for us on iTunes. An easy way to get there is to go to www.inventionstories.com forward slash review. More information and show notes can be found at our website, www.inventionstories.com. Thank you very much for listening today, and please tell a friend.